Okay, so it is noon. Uh, we like to get started at noon. If you're not new to Second Life or Science Circle or whatever, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you found us. Um, we do have the website that I just mentioned, and you can see what sorts of things are going on, all kinds of activities coming up between now and end of the year. And uh, what I like to do, everybody has their own style, but I love to have stuff in chat, okay? Because I, I know what I'm going to be speaking about, and I need, need to have the feedback. Now, the other thing is this topic, like a lot of topics I do, it, it tends to be out of my area of comfort, say to, so to speak. <laughs> and in this case, I'm talking about uh, primary, uh, what happens primarily in human females. And since I'm not, I'm definitely, uh, if there's any reproductive biologists or other people who know how this works, um, please uh, let me know if I've got any misconceptions or errors or whatever. It's a very complicated, or any, well, that too, except I'm only doing the up to where the um, embryo is implanted in the uterus. So it, it doesn't involve kids yet, unless, depending on your definition of kids, <laughs> okay? You're basically talking about something the size of a grain of sand at the, at the end. So, um, but then it would be a whole series of topics about kids if we're going that far. Okay, well, it's a couple minutes in, so let me get uh, started. And like I said, I'd love to, um, well, I do too, but I take a look at it. And uh, we are recording. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so let me, let me get started on that. Um, notice, uh, this is a topic we haven't, I don't think we've had a, top, uh, a presentation on this topic. But I noticed back in the spring, there were several articles out that said, hey, we just found out a bit more about how human reproduction works, and you might be surprised. And so uh, I'm, I thought, well, that's interesting. I, I wonder, you know, when the last time I uh, studied it, so, and what kind of misconceptions I had. So the deeper I got into it, the more fascinating it got, but also the more complicated. So trying to... Sum it up all within an hour. Oh, lots and lots of misconceptions. And that's not a pun, okay? So, um, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> I'm catching the... Uh, yeah, okay. So, anyway. Now, just as a caveat, and there's uh, for anyone who's squeamish about whatever topic, is that this is a direct talk about human reproduction from after the male gamete has been introduced. Um until basically the possibility of an embryo implanting in the inner lining of the uterus. Okay, so the presentation uh, details the, uh, it's kind of an amazing process. And yeah, that one, uh, male gamete, you know, there's all kinds of different things uh, that they're called. I'm just saying male gamete. Okay, so uh, it's an amazing process. And I'm basically going to talk about it at the organ and cellular and molecular level. And there's no photos of human anatomy or anything else, uh, because frankly, we know that part, okay? It's the, um, what goes on inside that uh, is the part that a lot of people don't know. And yeah, I'm going to use accurate and like, you know, male gamete versus sperm versus whatever, uh, common names in here. And I was going to uh, give you an entire metaphor for maternity hospital, but frankly, I ran out of time. And I can explain what it was I was getting at, uh, but um, I think you'll be interested nonetheless. Okay. So, first, let's take a look at cultural barriers. The reason why we may not all know all of this ourselves. It's basically forbidden knowledge is essentially, uh, by the way, the slides, I usually don't apologize for anything, but the slides are very dense <laughs> as far as both pictures and text. So. I'm going to talk about it, and that should give you plenty of information. You don't have to go reading a mile a minute trying to get everything. But the idea is the first thing is for cultural barriers is that there's a wide range of attitudes about 
uh, knowing anything about uh, reproduction. And, Frank, and in some cultures today and in the past, essentially it was like, okay, your parents are going to tell you the basics just before you get married. Um, and then young men sometimes learn by experience with an older woman. And so, but that has nothing to do with the reproduction process, or well, very little to do with the reproduction process. It's basically mechanics, okay? And other than that, it was like, well, I guess it's going to be a surprise. Uh, in, this, in the U.S., sex ed is kind of like treated like as driver's ed. <laughs> and if you happen to be in the U.S., you probably know what I'm referring to. It's essentially a wide range of practice ranging from nothing at all. Yeah, stick to your own lane. Ranging from nothing at all to a lot of misconceptions. And there's little about, like, you know, how it actually is working and more about the social aspects, like, don't do that, you know. Including cautions. I remember including cautions about the worst possible scenarios and stuff from authority figures. So most of the knowledge, of course, has to come from somewhere. So it's friends, movies, experimentation. And so it's not surprising that in places where sex ed uh, is the least, uh, um, in other words, there's no sex ed, that you have the highest teen pregnancy rates. And in some places, the least um, uh, prenatal care and all that stuff like that. So it co contrasts that to some of the countries in Northern Europe where children start learning at a very young age. It's mandatory. Uh, they learn the correct knowledge and the, with mature attitudes that basically lead to more positive uh, first experiences, less disease, teen pregnancy, greater gender equality, the whole bit. So that's the first thing that we approach is we don't know about this stuff because we're not taught and a lot of people don't check it out. There's also a wide range of bias. Now I got the little song ditty up there. I don't know if you uh, remembered. It's actually not, it's one of my least favorite songs because it basically says, hi, I'm ignorant, but let's get together anyway. But you know, it, it's, it's the, um, uh, the one that goes, you know, don't know much about history, don't know much about bio biology, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And I'm not a singer. Okay, but also I remember when I was in, um, yeah, I know, I'd have to practice, okay. So basically when I was in uh, school, I remember seeing this video and it was about, it started out like, when a man and woman really love each other, uh, then it, and then it became a, a very male-centric, anthropomorphized perspective. And I've got the, I've got, if you're interested in seeing the video that I found, it's right here, because I was absolutely gassed uh, to find that uh, when I, in other words, when I did a sex ed class, they, they showed these, you know, white hordes of, uh, of sperm racing through these big caverns to attack a poor innocent egg. And that was like, okay, that's sex ed. Okay, great. Okay, but that's not. <laughs> and then there, and then of course it's compounded by uh, popular things like uh, there was a a book which I still find, I still have on the shelf, which I, I which I found out basically was worth about five hundred dollars now. But um, it's everything you always wanted to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask. And it's by Dr. David Rulin in '69. And then of course there was a comedy. I'm dating myself, but there was a Woody Allen, yeah, about the same one. And if you're interested in that, now, uh, I, I caution you that some of the material in there may be you know, not quite um, politically correct or whatever, uh, but if you want to see it, you can you can see it. It's basically with the sperm uh, being paratrooper or parachuters uh, in an airplane. And so anyway, and then there were some pretty good books. There's one called Our Bodies, Ourselves, and other informative books that came out later. Okay, so what I'm basically saying is there's biases towards the male part. There's also uh, misinformation. And then, of course, a wide range of barriers. Now, you'll notice the quote there by the author of the book, the Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex, but we're afraid to ask. And in 1969, he basically said, most of us know more about the moon, 238 
million miles away than we do what happens six inches below our navels. And then in 2021, I found a good source for uh, talking about the different uh, stages of uh, development of embryo, and it's in 2021, but they had a similar message, a little more scholarly, they basically said, the molecular mechanisms underlying human embryogenesis remain largely unknown due to technical difficulties and ethical issues. And so you've still got the case where we don't know everything because of the taboo subjects, so to speak. Okay, now the problem with that is it's not just that we don't learn, it's that we get a cultural bias where women are basically passive vessels. Now, let me explain that. I, I was, uh, there were a couple people at the Moonbase uh, meeting at, on Monday, and I said I will explain that uh, during the presentation. And part of it is this bias education that basically goes. And so I want you, to, and I'll, this is from the video that I just gave you, uh, the li link to it, not the Woody Allen one, the other one. And these are little captures from there. It basically says, okay, so find out how many misconceptions you spot in this video. And so it starts out kind of like the journey of life starts with a fantastic or fascinating race. And then they show this white horde um, in, in some large cavern or whatever uh, with a blue tunnel at the end. Um, well, now that syzygy, I, I want you to, that's what I'm, trying to say that's not true. Okay, and then there's the idea, only one, the fastest and strongest, will reach the finish line. Some fall out of the race, getting lost in the fallopian tubes. Um, some are stopped by natural obstacles that protect against intruders. Now, I have no idea what that big blue um, amphitheater is there, but this is the part of the video. And then it goes, for those who make it towards the end, they compete fiercely. Well, yeah, we'll get into that. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, what I'm doing is I'm just going, this is the video, and it's not diff much different from the one I saw in the 60s. But I found it online the other day, and it was like, ah, they, you know. Um, so anyway, they're going to, uh, so we'll, we'll address the misconceptions here in a second. But those who make it toward the end, compete fiercely, and there's one, in the video, there's this one that isn't just like trying to attack the egg, but it's like, ah, I know the way, suckers, and it's going towards some other area there, and then it gets in, and it blows this white cloud <laughs> into the egg, and it says, finally, we have a winner, and it's like, what? Um, yeah, verbally insensitive. <laughs> okay, I have to see how much of, of what we're doing is sharing uh, <laughs> information. Okay, so then it goes half the man's and half the woman's chromosomes combined. Thought bubbles, ultimate. Well, okay, now, Mike, you just hit it on the head, so to speak, is um, it's the anthropomorphism that really got to me, as if this is some sort of male race uh, and, and a game, where in for the female, it's life and death. And also, it's more than just uh, the male contribution. Okay, so the first cell of the new baby, uh, now called the zygote, then the cells divide and begin to travel uh, at, to the safe and friendly habitat of the uterus. And there's a bubble of cells called a blastocyst that's formed in the inner cells make up the embryo and outer cells make up the, um, to nourish it. And then the blastocyst then finds a, well, what obstacles? We've got to define what the obstacles are. It's not, it's not like you have a, uh, a race where you're going to trip over um, a, uh, you know, steeplechase type race or stuff. Well, and Sumo, you know, that's exactly right. In other words, where's the woman in all this? Um, this is, that's, that's what, so any case, the final one was the blastocyst then finds a comfortable place to rest for 40 weeks. And it's like, what? And so here's a few of the misconceptions and questions. Like I <laughs> got tenure. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, here's a few of the misconceptions and questions I had. So let's go ahead and take a look at what really is happening. 
Yeah, and then they stopped working. Ha. Plus, how the heck do they know where to find the egg? Males never ask for directions. Okay. So in addition, there are <laughs> in it well, it is. And I have a reason for that that I'm gonna propose. Okay, so there's also bias laws. And the re and part of it is the woman is, you know, is in the laws themselves because people don't know how it works, perhaps. Uh, you've got the woman as a mere vessel for the man's seed. In fact, sperm actually means seed, and there's a reason for that. Now, you don't have to read all this, but basically in the U.S. and stuff like that, uh, um, there were a number of laws that basically were created with the impression that the woman's simply a mere vessel to the man's seed, and that that takes precedence over the woman's life, etc. Well, says a G, yes, ex <laughs> okay. Well, okay, but hang on a second because there's a lot of stuff that's wrong, not just a few things. Um, okay, so now what I'd like to convince you is that women are the engineers of life and basically they control the entire process from absolute beginning to end, and that basically the male contribution uh, at its very longest is simply um, halftime or halftime uh, entertainment, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, now you're right, and we'll get to the alleged heartbeat here in a minute, uh, but you got to get to where it's uh, six weeks in, and we're not even six seconds in. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so let's take a look at it. So let's let's take a look at some important questions. Um, well, and you're right, uh, Sumo, absolutely correct. And we'll get to that here in a second once we get to the actual in the uterus part, okay? So, uh, but, you're, but I'm glad you're bringing it up in chat as well. Well, you're right, there you go, boom, boom, boom. Uh, heart, heart cells, and plus... Re recall that what you're talking about is something the grain, a size of a grain of sand. It's not exactly a heart, and it's less than the grain of sand because that it, that talks about the entire thing. So okay, so let's let's take a look at some important questions. Uh, one of my duties as the presenter is to make sure that I present the material in an hour <laughs> or so, and of course to address all the questions and comments and stuff and have a good time and get an educational message out there. So let's let's talk about some important questions. Um, when did reproduction become thought of as a male controlled event in the process? In other words, okay, here's all the sperm raising to attack a poor defenseless egg and that's, re that's you know, reproduction. Well, I propose that 200, well, over 200, several hundred years ago, 1600s, 1700s, and stuff that there was a theory called preformationism that basically said that humans and plants and whatever, excuse me, humans and plants and whatever um, can't create life because life has already been created. In other words, once in Genesis. Okay, so the idea was that the sperm, and there were even little pictures of it, that the sperm had a tiny human in it. If you look closely there, it's got legs and arms, and that's the head, and I don't know what that is in the middle, except that could be the, uh, you know, the place on the top of the baby's head or something like that. But basically, so that the preformationism said that the male plants the seed that's already a tiny human into the female. <clears throat> what's called an animacule. And so the female becomes simply a garden that she needs to tend to the male seed until it becomes a human. And then, of course, you know, 20, 30, 40 years after. Um, so anyway, um, so what is the purpose of a woman in this process? Is it a passive vessel with no rights, or is it the engineer of life itself? And so the other thing is that in the monthly cycle, even the entire, uh, the monthly cycle was known for thousands of years. In the book of Leviticus, for example, it basically says to people who didn't know about, you know, the biology, it basically says, okay, 
after menstruation, the woman is unclean for about seven days, and then you can go back to it. But essentially what that is is halfway into the monthly cycle, which is the optimal day for getting pregnant. And so they, well, no, Henry VIII didn't know, you know, uh, you know, he was doing his thing, which actually he probably wasn't if you look at the history thing, because he had uh, syphilis and he was hugely, well, whatever, blah, blah, we can go into Henry VIII, but, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> this topic has a lot of thing. And then, okay, if reproduction is viewed as some kind of male game, then why are we depicting halftime, okay, instead of the entire uh, process? So let's take a look. Well, no, no, there, there are some um, males that we really should uh, <laughs> talk about here, but just I, I'm limited to an hour. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the parts. Whenever I look at uh, uterus, it goes, the uterus is about the size of a small uh, pear. And I'm going, oh, well, actually, that's kind of interesting. And so I was remembering my biology, and I was going, okay, uh, actually, that's about right. In other words, if there's nothing that's being grown or nothing intruding into the process, you've got a basically a pear-sized uh, uterus, much smaller in uh, um, premature females and also post older females, but those are the, that's what you have there. But if you look at it with the pear, it's very interesting. You've got, basically the pear's an ovary. It's got eggs in the middle area called an ovule, which is basically the female gamete. And then for the male, the, an the anther, the pollen is entered up there from the top, which is not too unlike uh, in, in female, except that in mammals, all of this takes place inside. And so uh, the stem there that's connected to the plant, I mean, you can only take the analogy so far, but it's kind of interesting in the diagram where uh, the difference, that, in other words, the similarities between um, a pear and, in other words, reproduction in a plant, or in this case with the fruit, and in human reproduction. In other words, there's some... Uh, similarity, some differences. Um, well, uh, uh, do you, uh, yes, I'm trying to, in this case, there's some really good stuff coming in on comments. And, and so I understand the social thing, and, and I'm not diminishing the idea of male and female bonding or anything else like that. Um, the Germans. Oh, 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 Simo, Simo, did you read the article? See what I. Uh, there is an article recently, and I, I can find it if I can have a little time at the end. But look up the one that basically says that the woman, this was in, this is what kind of got me started. They found that the woman actually determines which sperm gets to fertilize. Okay, now I'm, I'm not talking only about that it should be invitation only, okay, as to what, yeah, absolutely, that's why I'm saying, that's, okay, that's his point, absolutely. In other words, first of all, it should be invitation only as to who, what sperm gets in the first place. But the other thing is that right up to the point where the sperm's at the egg, it's the woman that's choosing which one is going to fertilize. And that's a fairly new uh, thing that they found, but I thought, I, I think I, re I was reading about that, and I was going, holy cow, this is much more interesting than I had learned in the past. Uh, <laughs> that's how to you. Okay. Um, but that, that's up to you. That's something beyond what I want to talk about. Okay, so anyway, now, by the way, and males in particular notice that the size of the parts over there uh, do not require drilling for oil, in other words, or anything else. So uh, you're talking about a fairly uh, small system here that until things get going, um... okay.
So what is the purpose? I'm, I'm watching my time. Um, the purpose of this whole thing is to complete meiosis. Now, let's real refresher. Don't read. I mean, unless you're a speed reader, don't read any of that stuff. But the idea is to is in meiosis you are want to uh, it enables genetic diversity and then repairs of the uh, genetic uh, materials, DNA and stuff like that. So in meiosis, you've got this um, process where there's a crossover of some DNA, and you end up with gamete cells. Now, that can be both in the male and in the female. But essentially, now you've got, instead of the parent just uh, making a clone, you've got a mix match of some DNA that creates a new being. Now, the interesting part is, is that in the egg, in the female, is that this process kind of just stops or is suspended until, if and when, there is a male gamete that joins, and then meiosis then is completed. So essentially, now I read that it's at metaphase 2 in meiosis 2 part, or metaphase in meiosis 2. And I'm going to have to go back and check that out. Here again, this is a very complicated subject, and I was reading through it trying to understand everything. But the idea is that in meiosis, you're ending up with gametes, which have a, a full set, not half of the males or half of the females, but a full set of 23 chromosomes, a haploid cell that's uh, looking to complete uh, meiosis. When it completes meiosis, in other words, when the two gametes meet, then you have a pair of uh, 46 chromosomes, in other words, paired up 23 different types of chromosomes. And now it's able to, just like any other cell, to um, do mitosis, in other words, to grow and regenerate and such. So uh, that's the difference uh, between those two. OK, let's continue on. So there's some important facts here, is that one is the you may not know this, because this is brand new, too, but both gametes can be produced artificially. Let me repeat that, and I'll, and I'll show you the article. They both can be produced artificially and then combine to create an embryo. Embryo. Uh, embryo. Now, the female's reproductive system, particularly the uterine system, but also the entire system, it controls the process from beginning to end, and there is well, that depends on whether it's fun. Like I said, if it's invitational, it's fun. If it's not, then you run into those laws that say no matter where the sperm came from, you still have to raise the kid, uh, is kind of my implication there. Um, so a male, if you look up what is a male, what you're going to find is a male, whether it's a flower with anther and, and pollen, a male is the, the individual that provides motile, mobile gametes. But it's the female, of course, that then creates the other gamete, uh, grows the embryo, develops a fetus, etc. So as engineers of life, they control the whole thing. And the male contribution, like I said, uh, is only part of it, or half time. Now, so the key concepts here are that Excuse me. Okay, so key concepts are that there are hormones in the system and the brain which control the whole monthly cycle by chemical signals, and I'll, and I'll go over that here. The other thing is that, and this may come as a shock to guys, but the sperm have absolutely zero chance of fertilizing an egg unless the woman does a series of chemical reactions with the sperm in order to get it uh, moving, in order to get it to the fallopian tubes, in order to find the egg, uh, all of that. It's called capacitation and thermo chemo and chemotaxis. And some of that is pretty new, too, as far as what they found. And then, of course, in the developmental cycle, there's about 23 different stages just in the embryo uh, um, embryogenesis called the Carnegie stages. Okay, and yeah, this gets a little, and, and I know this gets a little deep, but then uh, 
I was a biochemist, or you know, once a biochemist, always a biochemist, and I like the detail myself. Okay, so I'll try to I'll try to also not keep it too deep. Well, life, death, chemotaxis. Ah, you're funny, sis. Okay. Um, so in in the monthly reproductive hormone cycle, you've got a lot of stuff going on, lots of hormones. Now, ladies, pay attention to the one on the right, which you probably already know personally if you've ever, uh, if you, if, well, you probably know personally. Um, because what happens is it's not only a bunch of hormones racing through your body, but those lines on the other side are amino acids uh, and all kinds of other chemicals. The, the hormones are only a tiny little part at the bottom. And these are all enormous and lipids and uh, vitamins and stuff. In other words, it's not – your system goes wacko during the monthly cycle and uh, because there's so much going on. It's not just uh, – uh, a small pear-shaped area down uh, between your navel and your legs. Okay, so basically there are also well, <laughs> okay, there's um, you can feel that other things are going on, okay? Uh, based from both emotions and biochemically and everything else. And guys don't get to experience that. So there are both, there are also other cycles going on. There's this hormone cycle which basically the brain is the conductor of this orchestrated effort. And then there's the ovarian cycle, which actually is independent of the monthly cycle, but a egg can be trigger, triggered by the brain to enter into this. And then there's the uterine cycle. Uh, so there's all these cycles that are going on in the uh, woman's reproductive system. So let, let's talk a tiny bit about what's called capacitation thermo taxes and um, chemo taxes is the, the thing to know is that sperm are not natural macho um, cells over a 10 hour period from the time they enter the uterus which by the way there's only about one percent that get up there well absolutely they need to be properly coordinated and that was what I found is so fascinating about this properly synchronized and it all has to do with hormone communications. In other words, the brain releases hormones that go into the blood system that are picked up by the ovaries, and then the ovaries uh, release hormones that are picked up by the uterus, and the uh, zygote releases hormones, and the egg is releasing hormone or hormones and chemicals to the spermatozoa, and it's like, whoa, this is really cool. Well, and, and Simo, you also hit it on the head is about, you know, when you mess with the chemo part and then also what can go wrong, <laughs> you know, there's lots and lots of, uh, this is a very complicated type of subject. Okay, so for the, for the sperm itself, you've basically got one of the smallest cells in the body. And if you look at the diagram there over the, the bottom left, essentially the, there's a little head, there's a, there's a part in front of the head which is called the acrosome. The acrosome has enzymes that uh, it has enzymes that will break down the protective layers uh, outside the egg so that the sperm can enter. And then it's got a mitochondria uh, behind it and a, and a little tail like you know um, any other little. Um, I'm trying to think of. Uh, uh, you know, any other little bacteriozoa type of thing is the mitochondria then uh, is the one that produces the energy for the tail, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then the egg itself, I know it's a tiny little diagram there, but take a look at it. It basically, you've got the nucleus and then you've got, it's surrounded by something called the zona pellucida, uh, pellucida. And then around the outside, there's this corona of cells called the corona radiata. And uh, there's a little chemistry there and stuff like that. And essentially what happens is over 10 hours, the female has to stimulate the sperm tail. In other words, it becomes from a sperm to, be, to a spermatozoa. The sperm itself is passively aspirated into the uterus. So there's only 1% uh, that ever even get in there. 
And then it guides it with a thermal gradient. By the way, they know that thermal gradients in uh, bacteria follow thermal gradient, but they didn't know about that in humans inside the last 20 years. And so the difference in the, the, in the woman's temperature that goes up actually helps form that gradient. So the little sperm guys have no idea uh, where the fallopian tubes are or even that there are fallopian tubes or where the egg is. So they're basically following a heat source up to the fallopian tubes. And then the uh, egg releases some chemicals in order to go, hey, uh, sperm, I'm over here. Otherwise, the, the, you know, the, the uh, probability of a tiny little cell reaching the egg centimeters away is, is near zip. Okay, the other thing that happens is basically uh, that, it, that it has to prepare that sperm to even be able to move and then to, to get into the egg. So it's very, very fascinating. So it's not like, you know, macho cells uh, racing up to the egg and then uh, penetrating. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. There are also uh, some stages here, and I'm only covering the first few stages in um, the first uh, days, up to the, like day seven, day eight of this whole thing. And then you're not talking, this is not, um, so I'm not, not even coming anywhere near where it's a fetus. Essentially, it's the size of a period by the time uh, I'm covering on this presentation. But you've got fertilization, you've got meiosis complete, and then cellular uh, uh, cleavage or division uh, into what's called a morula, and then et cetera, et cetera. So I'll talk about that part here. Okay, but... Let's go back and, 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 mis and correct some of the misinformation. In other words, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a good uh, statement. Okay. So let's go back and correct some of the uh, misinformation. Um, first of all, the hormone cycle. The, you, you might have heard it said that the brain is the most important sex organ. Okay, so the, the monthly cycle is orchestrated by, by the brain. Essentially, the, what happens is the hypothalamus, which is deep in the brain there. Now, you'll notice that the, the most important and, um, parts about the brain are really deep in the... Um, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to get to that soon. It's, it's one of the last slides here. I'm watching my time is that uh, in the monthly cycle, the hypothalamus is, um, but I'm glad you guys are, um, I'm glad you guys are pointing this stuff out so that I, I, I make sure I don't forget something. But basically, in the middle of the brain there, you've got some things which are really, really important. The thalamus, for example, is the, excuse me, is the one that handles motory and sensory. Um, I'm not even going to touch that. Okay. Uh, control. Whereas the hypothalamus is the one that controls appetite, sex drive, heart rate, body temperature, growth, behaviors. Well, in the reproductive thing, what it does is it puts out, at the beginning of the cycle, it puts out what's called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone. And that signals the pituitary, which actually is the little hormone maker there, to release what's called follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And then at the end of the cycle, I was wondering, well, okay, if it's a cycle, how does it get back to the beginning of the cycle? Well, at the end of the cycle, basically, the follicle-stimulating hormone tails off, and then the hypothalamus detects this in the blood system and then releases more of that gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, which then starts the whole process over again. Really fascinating. If you're a biochemist. <laughs> okay. So let's go to like part one. I've got kind of part three of the ovarian cycle. Remember that the ovaries do their own thing and they are not in the monthly cycle. It takes a while to raise an egg. And then they get uh, stimulated by um, some hormones at the beginning of the cycle. Essentially there's these little oocytes, which are immature eggs, and then they're created in the meiosis process. And then on about day seven, in other words, at the end of menses, 
uh, starting, which I have no idea why they started the, um, the cycle, uh, in other words, day-wise from Mensis. To me, that's the end of the cycle. That's not the beginning. But whatever, maybe it's just because it's more obvious, is that um, follicles then are, the follicles is about 15 to 20, 12, uh, 15 to 20 every month that uh, start to mature. And basically then the follow, follicles stop growing except for one. And to me, it's kind of like, uh, anybody watch Wonder Woman and you have the Amazons and there's no males in there in the process and they have a, a contest to see who, you know, that sort of thing. So to me, it's like, okay, all these follicles are doing their thing. And then there's this dominant follicle that basically says, okay, uh, you're the one that's got the egg. Uh, go for it, and it grows, and then, but the follicles are not done, and then the ovum erupts from the follicle at a particular time, and then, but the follicles are not done yet. In other words, they've been nurturing these eggs for a long time, so part two, I'll get to that in a second, where they keep the uterus prepared uh, and become what's called a corpus luteum to keep it prepared. Okay, so, here again, here's a picture of little follicles and the little eggs inside and um, the hormones that are produced by the pituitary then signal the follicles to develop in the first place. And they then they get this. What they do is they produce hormones estradiol and inhibin, which then go back to the uh, hypothalamus pituitary and inhibit further follicle growth. So you only have about 15 or 20 of these guys Every cycle, every every month or so, um, but you know it actually ranges, and, I, and I'll show you there. Um, the lutein part of it, uh, the the first part, which is about fourteen days, is pretty regular, but it's the end part that it can be anywhere from like ten to sixteen days. That's why women have uh, different um, uh, their period cycles can vary, and so anyway, it's the part with the uterine part that. Uh, what can vary? Okay, so anyway, so you don't get so that so basically it inhibits follicle growth, so you don't get too many of these. I mean, the chemistry behind this is just mind-boggling and fun. So what happens then is the mature ovum gets big enough and then erupts from the follicle. Actually, it erupts into the abdominal cavity, and it's like, oh no! But what actually happens is the follicle then sends a chemical over to the fallopian tube, goes, hey, come closer. And there's these little fingers at the end of the fallopian tube. And they then the ovum has these little sticky cells on it, and it kind of swipes over it and picks up the ovum and then sucks it into the fallopian tube. It's Like I said, it's really very fascinating if you look at how the whole mechanism works. And then inside there, the ovum is guided along it by these waves of cilia. It doesn't have a tail or anything. It's the biggest cell in our body, and you can actually, it's, it, and you can see it. It's like um, just the size of a small period on a, and that's not a, never mind. Okay, so anyway, on, um, on typing. Okay, so the ovum is guided along the tube by these cilia and then muscle contractions in it, and it, it's going to take about four or five days for it to get to the uterus. If it's not fertilized, which of course is most of the time because women can't have a baby every month, is that it then uh, lives only about a day and then disintegrates into the fallopian and uh, gets recycled there. Okay, so it's not a race. Uh, the sperm are helped along the entire way. There are no caverns. The walls are all uh, touching each other. It's mostly, uh, you know, thin mucus uh, inside. And so, and the other thing is, is, is that if you're talking about, uh, originally I was going to make this as a, as a hospital. And so the, if you, if you can imagine the sperm are in this waiting room and it's fine, they're in there, but they're going to, most of them die in a day. It doesn't, you know, it takes like three to six days. By the end of the sixth day, there's very few of them sitting in the waiting room. And then the cervix acts as a, closed door, a locked door for all but one day of the entire month. There's no blue 
tunnel there in the back. Uh, it basically acts, uh, you know, the only time, what happens is around day four, well, day 12, it says the estrogen, well, exactly, but, you know, okay, so the day, day 12, estrogen surge, there's an estrogen surge, which then signals the cervix to produce a acidic jelly, which is thinner than the thick mucus that is protecting the cervix against intruders, uh, both uh, uh, diseases and otherwise. Uh, that helps the sperm to enter the uterus. Okay, so the sperm only live three to six days. Most of them die the first day. So fertilization can only take place. This is why I call it half-life. The sperm can only fertilize the egg because the egg is only going to live 12 to 24 hours. So in other words, they got to get up there uh, with the help of the female. And they can live up to, say, eh, you know, five days uh, before. In other words, fertilization can take place between five days before and the day after which is about 20% of the month, which, by the way, for you guys, uh, halftime, if you look at a football or a soccer game, you've got the quarters, 15 minutes each, an hour, plus the halftime, so it adds up to about 20%. Well, now, Super Bowl, <laughs> it's funny you should mention that, Natalie, because Super Bowl halftime lasts 30 minutes, not 12 to 15 minutes, and the reason for that, of course, is money. Okay, so that's a little different. Okay, now here's the one, yeah, the show. <laughs> okay, or halftime entertainment or whatever you want to call it. Uh, okay, so now this is amazing is that uh, this is from BBC. You can look at it yourself. I've got the, uh, let me uh, look for the there. Okay, you, here is the uh, link there. But what, what this company has done, now think of this. Okay, I'm going to stop and. Go, okay, think of what I'm saying, is what this company has been able to do is to create the starting material stem from stem cells. They've already done it in a mouse. In other words, they've done this, put it in a mouse female. There's nothing, uh, like I said, uter uterus and stuff cannot be, and all of the brain and stuff can't be reproduced or uh, artificially but you can produce some of these cells. And so they've got the epiblast, hyperblast, uh, messenger, and tropoblast, all these cells. You basically stick it in a shaker or whatever, shake it up, and it outforms, ta-da, something that looks like an embryo. They're not saying it's an embryo. But they have done this for a mouse. They took stem cells out of its tail and created a embryo, stuck it into a female mouse, out came perfectly healthy little baby mice. Okay, now, like I said, I'm stopping here just for a second to tell you the significance of it. That means that same-sex couples, people that are infertile, can take stem cells from themselves and create babies from, uh, yeah, it is cool, from their own DNA. In other words, this, the, you still need a surrogate somewhere in there, but the idea is that uh, anyone can create a baby if they want. Okay, so uh, now. Well, that, that uh, yeah, and then the source of the stem cells, in other words, well, not necessarily, uh, because you could, what you do is you create a essentially two gametes. You could take stem cells from a male or stem cells from two, two females if you want and then stick them together, or two males, stick them together and you end up with the same thing, a zygote, essentially. Uh, no, but what they're saying is that, and you'll have to read the article, but basically what they're saying is that they are creating gamma, gametes, in other words, haploid cells that then when you stick them together, you end up with a diploid cell, a zygote, that then becomes an actual embryo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, not from one source. In other words, you can have a couple, but it, the couple can be same sex, you know, whatever. You can, in fact, I don't know if you could do it, you could have a baby from your own DNA, except that then the DNA wouldn't be mixed matched. Uh, but you'll have to see, you know, how far they are able to go on this thing. 
Well, it would be a clone if it were strictly you. Okay. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, in continuing on, uh, essentially that, um, like I said, the sperm are kind of small, helpless cells that have to be uh, capacitated over 10 hours. And then you've got both the thermotaxis, in other words, the thermal grade going, okay, go toward the light source, and then, or heat source, and then the chemotaxis, and I've uh, talked about how that uh, works. Now, what also happens at the egg is that, and some of those are just quotes from the video, but at the egg what happens is that it actually takes several, it's not like one sperm is the only thing you need, it actually takes several sperms attached to this outer corona radiator to trigger what's called a cortical reaction it, it, that runs on a calcium gradient. I mean, you can get really detailed on this. But it basically makes the inner part that surrounds the nucleus, the female nucleus, the egg part, uh, impermeable to other spermatozoa. So you don't have what's called uh, polyspermia. Spermi In other words, you've got one. But what actually happens, if you look at the... Um, Supposedly, the head of the sperm, the first thing that happens is the sperm gets decapitated. In other words, it doesn't need the tail anymore. And then all it needs is the nucleus, not whatever it's injecting into the um, female there. It needs the male nucleus. And then the, well, <laughs> uh, there, you, there you go. And by the way, you can actually, I, can, I raise chickens and I look at eggs and you can actually see the little parts inside the egg where some of this stuff has taken place. Because essentially you're looking at the yolk sac and the you know, part that's surrounded and stuff. But whatever. So um, you have the, let me go on to the next one. I'm watching my time. Is essentially what you have is you've got the male and female cells that meet inside the egg and you've got the nuclei. And then the nuclei come together and then complete the meiosis process. And they actually, by the way, if, for people that know how the, the thing works, where they line up, uh, the lineup part actually, the axis is toward where the sperm came in. And then it all uh, happens. So you look on the, the one to the left there, you've got the one on the right basically has the 23 pairs of 46 chromosomes, but then the uh, egg nuclei, the bigger one over on the left there, and the male one, um, combine and complete the meiosis uh, so that you have a zygote, in other words, the, the first thing. Um, now, what you call a baby is up to you as far as, um, you know, religiously, etc., like that, but you're talking about a single cell at this point. Okay, so the egg continues to travel down the fallopian tube. It, do, it doesn't like, you know, stop and then for have entertainment and then coming down. It's going down the fallopian tube. It's in an area uh, earlier um, that's the wider area of the fallopian tube um, where, where it normally gets fertilized. And so it only lives for a short period of time. And so day one, essentially after fertilization, you've got the single cell, which is now a diploid cell with all, with pairs of chromosomes, that then divides into two cells. A2, it divides into four cells. Now, each of these little cells is called a blastomere, and it's important to realize that they're not free to roam here. They are contained in an impermeable, a uh, fairly hard thing called a zona uh, pellicida. And so the cells actually then, uh, they can't expand, they compact. So the cells become, the membranes around the nuclei of the cell actually dissolve and the whole thing starts, you know, in other words, it's the nuclei that are doing the cleaving, the dividing. And so you've got essentially four cells on day two, eight cells, and they're all smaller and smaller and smaller. And then day four, you've got 16 cells. And then by the time you have 16 or 32 cells, and they're all compacted in this little shell, uh, it's called a morula. Now, morula is a name for like raspberry, OK? 
okay? Because that's kind of what it would look like if you looked at it. So now the uterus has been preparing for an egg, regardless or not of whether it gets a fertilized egg, because it's not going to see a fertilized egg, because, it, I mean, a unfertilized egg, because it'll resolve into the fallopian tube. But the uterus, particularly the wall, the endometrium, has been preparing this whole time uh, just in case. And it does it every month. And then if it doesn't happen, of course, then the uterine wall dies and sloughs off and the whole cycle starts uh, over again. Uh, so it's, by the way, it's not a particularly safe environment. And I'll explain that here in a minute. So the cells in that little morula up on the left there, it, it isn't automatically a blastocyst. Okay, the cells in the middle will become the embryo and the other cells then what the other cells do is create a cavity. It's actually a cyst. And they do it through uh, a sodium ion uh, gradient. And it draws liquid in there and creates this cyst. So it becomes a blastocyst when it's about 50 to 150 cells. And it's got this harder outer case. Well, you get, you get enzymes from the ovaries that have been do, that have been helping the uterus to prepare and then now you get this uh, you know by the time they get a whole bunch of cells in there the little outer cell outer shell that yellow thing up on the top right can't hold it anymore and you get a hatching or a rupturing from that shell so that the blastocyst then is now free inside the uterus but there's more chemical reactions and stuff. And it doesn't just like sit inside and rest in the uterus uh, for 40 weeks. It tunnels in. Essentially, there's, you could see the diagram in the middle. Well, what happens is the, uh, you've got that cis part, the white part, which is fluid. And then you've got what will become the fetus in that little green and yellow area there that's over on one side which orients towards the urine wall. And then, and then the middle there will become the amniotic cavity, interestingly enough. And then you've got, and so what, what it does is it has to do all this stuff until the placenta is formed uh, later on. So it's helping the little um, egg to get its nutrients, which it gets from the uterus and to continue to grow. Now, so let's go back to, and I'm watching the time. I will go over a little bit, but not much, because we're down toward uh, um, slide. Uh, let's see, what slide are we on? Uh, 38 out of, uh, I only have like five, six left, okay? So, the ovaries don't just kind of like go, okay, we've done our job, uh, let's, let's go watch TV. Is essentially, they, so the ruptured follicle, the one that, that, that uh, created the ovum in the first place, then becomes what's called a corpus luteum. Now that actually plays an enormous part in keeping things going because what would happen if the egg were not fertilized? Well, There'd be signals back to, uh, there'd be signals to the uterus that goes, okay, well, we're done. Go ahead and uh, let's prepare for the next cycle. And the lining would slough off. And that's not good if you've got a uh, embryo in there. So um, at the beginning of, this, of the month, essentially the ovaries then release estrogen into the bloodstream, which then thickens the uterus lining called the endometrium. And then the embryo sends a, the embryo itself once it's fertilized, which bear in mind that's not every cycle, obviously, sends a signal to the ovary going, hey, uh, keep that corpus luteum alive because that's what's sending uh, uh, something called pres uh, progesterone that keeps the embryo, it gives the embryo what it needs and then helps to keep the uterus uh, from going into its menses cycle. I mean, it's, it's, it's very fascinating. 
here that they signal each other and go, okay, this is what's going on. Okay, so the diagram on the left is what the company says, well, has demonstrated with mice anyway that they can do, is they, they put all these cells together, rattle around, it becomes what looks like that thing in day, um, uh, eight or nine there, is where there's, mat there's cellular def def uh, differentiation. You've got those hypoblasts, epoblasts, et cetera, tropoblasts. Um, it looks similar to that there. And then, but then from there, it's got to be back, put back into the uterus, and then it starts differentiating into a, um, a full-blown embryo that becomes a um, fetus at eight weeks, okay, if all that makes sense. Okay, let me keep going here. Okay, there's uh, what's happening between day six and day 23. Now, bear in mind that even on day 23, you're talking about something the size of two to three millimeters. So something the size of uh, whatever two or three millimeters is. I had an <laughs> example of that. But essentially, that's what's happening. It, it erupts from the zone, the zone of grain of, yeah, grain of sand. Well, even, even the slightly bigger than the grain of sand, but not much, you know, it's still not very big even in 23 days. Okay, and so essentially this is the process there where it then differentiates and then becomes a full-blown um, thing where you've got the umbilical cord and you've got the yolk sac, which uh, a lot of people will say that that's not a yolk sac. You know, we're not chicken, but eh, try to convince me otherwise um, because it needs uh, nourishment be until it's uh, got a full-blown... Um, uh, placenta started. Okay, so my final remarks then is that what could go wrong? <laughs> okay, well, lots can go wrong, but the whole process takes its toll. In other words, uh, it, for human females, at about 20 weeks, in other words, I just showed uh, it up through about, what, 23 days, what, a few weeks? Um, by 20 weeks, a human female will have 7 million eggs. By the time they're born, they're down to 2 million. By the time they're able to have kids, it's down to 300,000. And then they lose about 1,000 eggs a month. By age 30, they're down to 36,000. Now, if you actually add that up, in other words, how many months are there between 30 and, say, 50 or 60 or 50-something, 50 um, that's plenty. <laughs> in other words, even if they lose a thousand a month, that's that's plenty. And then by age forty, you have about three percent of what you originally had. Okay, and then only twenty or thirty percent of the fertilized eggs reach the blastocyst stage. So you don't even know that your eggs are fertilized because you're you've only got a tiny little thing in your fallopian tube. And then up to a quarter of pregnancies end in natural miscarriage because something is not right. Um, okay, in guys, it also takes a toll. And so there's not, there, there aren't, uh, you know, a limited number of eggs. But if you look at that diagram there, and I'll be done in about a minute. Uh, so I'm five minutes over. So if you look at that diagram, there's two things going on. And I think Natalie may have mentioned it or something. But essentially, and, and if anyone has better numbers, but I was looking all over the place for like, okay, how many sperm get in? How many get to the egg? And the numbers are wildly different. Everything from like 2 million up to 300 million. Uh, only 1% does get up to the uterus to begin with. And then you've got anything from, uh, I heard, I, I saw one article. I mean, these are scholarly papers too. It says anything from a few dozen find the egg up to thousands, um, find the egg. And, but most of them die on the way from stress, pH, differences, mucus, immune system, all that. But even then, for a guy, if you look at that, the peak time for a guy to do this is around eh, late 20s, early 30s kind of period, okay? But 
what's been what's weird is that male fertility has been coming down. If you look over on uh, the right side, it basically said back in say seventy three, the average uh, sperm count uh, worldwide. I don't know what oh milliliter per milliliter. Okay, millions per milliliter it was a hundred, basically a hundred. And by 2018, you're down to like below 50 or half. Uh, so I don't know what's happening there, but and then somebody mentioned uh, something about the Y chromosome also having a problem. Okay, so that's kind of my. I hope it wasn't too. I hope it was. I didn't, I don't know, but I hope it wasn't too. I hope it, I hope you found some interest in it. I hope you found something that you didn't know.